It's a big, it's not a fluffy orange that runs up and down the court. Is it an orange though? Is it like the fruit an orange? It's or is the he Syracuse just an orange? orange. Person? We in the eye an of the beholder. I don't think it's a fruit. I it's think the orange eye of the is. It's just an. Or, it's, it's the, the color. color right? Orange. Whatever. We yeah. are orange. We are orange. Syracuse orange. We are orange. <laughs> orange yep. are we? Our goal in this podcast is to know Jesus better and by the power of His Spirit do better, so together we can be a little better. Welcome to A Little Better Podcast. Um, I am actually your host, Brad Files, uh, sitting in the chair, the seat of power. The chair of because power. Because once again, our good friend, Daniel White, brought us the word uh, on Sunday and here to correct all the mistakes he made. Yes, thanks, Nate. Nate Miller the only reason I'm joining us here. here. For a little, uh, a, li- a lighter Pharisees. touch. <laughs> 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 well, welcome everyone. You all know the drill. We are here because you took us to week two of four yeah. of our series on uh, suffering uh, called When Life Hits Hard. When Life Hits Hard. So why don't you give us your message in 60? Yeah, 60 seconds. So Nate last week uh, talked about the purpose or our theology of suffering. And I picked it up. Okay, what do we do with that in the middle, the messy middle of the start of our pain to the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. And for some of us, that's not until we go to meet Jesus. And so what, how do we respond to it? And that Mm -hmm. was what it was. And it was uh, kind of geared towards we need to respond um, and how we properly respond as followers of Jesus is by biblically lamenting. And I gave a four-step formula for that, which was mentioned by Mark Vogrop in his book, uh, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, which we even mentioned last week. Excellent. That was way shorter. I know, right? I redeemed myself seconds. from previous weeks of so, going like 120 said, seconds. <laughs> right. And I know you said it was uh, based on Mark Rogop's. Uh, am I saying that anywhere? Yeah, Vogrop. V R O G. Based on Mark's book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but truly, the structure really came out of the Psalms. Yeah, which is that, that's what he, he mm-hmm. nods to is like you can look at any biblical lament, whether it's a corporate lament or a um, personal lament, specifically in the Old Testament, even more specifically in the book of Psalms, in those, and where you could almost exegetically break down those chapters with this fourfold formula and see it. Uh, surfacing and bubbling up of like, this is how David prays, you know, this is how the Psalms Mm -hmm. teach us to pray. If the Psalms are the Hebrew people's uh, prayer book, prayer guide, you know, Jewish followers of Yahweh, um, this is their book to pray. This is how they prayed. They, um, you know, the word, the one word answer that I used, he uses kind of some phrases in that, but the one word I, I just said, turn, ask, request, trust, yeah. uh, which he uses some different phrases and fleshes it out a little bit differently in his book. But um, that's how I took his information paired with like just trusting the scriptures. And okay, that's that's our fourfold formula. Yeah, I think anyone who's read the Psalms, the, the, you've a lot more, you know, ne- negative, a lot yeah. more concerns, a lot more suffering than rejoicing even mm-hmm. probably, um, you know, in the Psalms. Which in that book I found, I read it as well. He really talks early on too about this language and way of which we approach and communicate to God, mm-hmm. which is lament and how yet it is probably one of the most neglected, if you call it a spiritual discipline or mm-hmm. habit of followers yeah. of Christ, that how, and you look at the amount of times you refer to it, like, I don't know if it's a third of the Psalms or a significant portion of the Psalms are lament. You have lamentations. You have other books as well yeah. mm-hmm. talking about this, but yet. Yeah. There's, when, many, there's many, like even just fragments of books of whether it's narratives, like when you have like, I, I mean, come to my mind, like, I don't know if like First Samuel, uh, you know, would be considered a lament, but you know, like Hannah, when she's barren and she can't have sure. a child, like she's praying out and crying out to God mm-hmm. um, in her weeping. Right. And, and even Samuel uh, in the midst of that thinks that she's drunk, you know, like, cause she's crying. So emo- she's mm-hmm. like, so, you know, pouring her heart out, which made me think I read Hebrews five, seven through nine and the language of what, how Jesus prays, it says he gave fervent prayers, you know, Mm -hmm. um, of tears of anguish is what it says in the scriptures, like fervent cries and petitions and tears is what Hebrews says that how he prayed. You, you had made a statement in there that lemon lamenting is how Jesus prayed. I don't think I got the statement quite. One of the ways, yeah. One One of the the ways ways that Jesus prayed. Yeah, lamenting was one of the ways Jesus prayed. And something I heard someone else say, I have no idea where they got it from, and we could even ask, is it valid or not? But the Psalms are the prayer book of Jesus. Yeah. I mean, that, that, I don't think that's overstates it, but maybe. I don't know if that would be an overstatement, but like, Mm -hmm. 
I think the Psalms are the prayer book of the followers of God in the Old Testament, and mm-hmm. and you know, and Jesus obviously he's a New Testament figure, but he yeah. his scriptures were you know there's this all these theological he is the scripture he's sure. the Word made flesh right, but as he is walking on the earth, like when he was raised as a Jewish child, he's raised on the Old Testament scriptures yeah. and. The and Psalms the, are in the Old Testament, and how he would learn how to pray is from the Psalms. And, you know, like, if mm-hmm. you look at the, there's a Crossway book. Um, here we go, recommend another resource. <laughs> Don't forget to put this in the show notes. Those will be in the uh, notes. Yeah. And so it's a, uh, by Mark Jones, it's called The Prayers of Jesus. And he walks through, like, all the times in the New Testament where we find Jesus praying, mm-hmm. and he examines his prayers. And there's so many references of, like, Oh, in the psalm, like this is a qu- quotation from the Psalms, or this right, is a right. this is a reference back to the Psalms. Like now, I read that a couple months ago, but like, yeah, you should see Jesus. He's praying the Psalms, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. He's praying, which I think is so unique, and what I appreciated about your talk as well is like this is such a prevalent thing or a thing we see within Scripture, but yet, how often do I lament, mm-hmm. or even know how to lament, or do we even? As a church body, talk about that or even corporately do that. It's just, yeah. I love that we were able yeah. to kind of really dig into something that maybe mm-hmm. it's the American church. Like it, it, We've think, talked about this where like, man, we, we like to your point, like we eat it away. We, we, we bury it. We do all these other things yeah. when it's like, man, we got to learn how to step into it and step into it in a healthy way. Yeah, I, I think just most of the time in the, in the Western church, like, or at least me personally, I'll just speak for myself. I think I made a sideways comment about this Sunday, but like it when I am praying or in the midst of suffering and I do go to God in prayer, most of the time my first prayer is like, God, take this away. Stop this. Mm -hmm. And like, we don't see David doing that necessarily in the structure for lament. His first thing is he just goes to God openly and he turns to him in the midst of his pain to fix his eyes on, on the Lord. And, and, and then he's, He's saying, God, I don't understand. Why is this happening? Why are you allowing this? Why is this happening so long? Because it feels like this, like he's being open and vulnerable and honest. And then he makes this request to God of like, God, I need you to come through in this way. And then ultimately I'm going to trust you though. Uh, and, mm-hmm. But like for me, I think most of the time I'm like, God, this is not nice. Uh, can you stop now? Um, thank you. <laughs> next, next question. You know, uh, like that's how I pray. If I, even if I don't, try to avoid it or bury it or cover it up in my life. Mm -hmm. Even when I find myself praying, I'm not praying rightly. I'm just praying, God, take this away. I don't like this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So many Psalms, I'm going to say you got, if if a third of them start with a theme of rejoicing, two thirds of them start with concerns, you know, and, and laments or whatever. And they almost all turn. And that turning point really is, you know, eyes on God, yeah. claiming you know who He is, claiming His promises. Making it, there's only one psalm that I remember that ends like darkness is my closest friend. Mm. I think there's I think I only remember one psalm mm. that doesn't really make the turn yeah. you know, towards there may towards be there the may light. be more, but yeah. I mean in the book of Lamentations, you know it there it's not all full. If you I mean if you do a you know the Lamentations race, don't wrap up nicely. They don't wrap up. It doesn't wrap up cleanly because the people are in the midst of their turmoil. They're in right. the midst of devastation. They're in the midst mm-hmm. of it. And I think it's okay that, you know, uh, where if you break down Psalms 13, you know, there's four or five verses all about, no, 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 God, I this is not nice. I need you to do this. And then there's one verse that says, but I trust you. Right. You know, but I trust you because you've been good to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there, if you break down the ratio of our praying, our praying is to God turning to him it's not this clean like if you pray for 10 minutes make sure you spend two minutes doing this two minutes doing this two minutes it's not that it's it's that's where it moves though it moves us in that direction of Uh we land in our trust and your trust could be like but god i trust you because you 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 are good you are good yeah um and and maybe that's all you say Mm -hmm. maybe that's all you say in the midst of your lamenting and it's one sentence and you Mm -hmm. just keep saying it over and over until you believe it you right. know, like, uh, you know, in the midst of that. But um, but this lamenting is just foreign. It's like a foreign language to us. We have. Well, and I think part yeah. of it, too, is like you gave us a great four step, four steps. Here's what you do. And again, in our mind, it's like, all right, I just do Let's these do things. It, and that'll solve our problem. But, but it's even not, that's not it. 
like I wanted to ask you, like, so how long then does lamenting take, or how long should one lament? Or can like, lamenting go wrong? Yeah, can you do it wrong? I mean, yeah, yeah but yeah. Uh, I think I think where it goes wrong and off the rails is even what we want to talk about. I want to talk about that too, but like of our, I, I talked about complaining to God, mm-hmm. and I think sometimes in our step our step formula, when lamenting can go wrong, I'll say it like this: is when we uh, get a log jam in the process mm-hmm. and we stop all halfway through. Right, Mm because think about if you turn to God, and then you just start asking Him uh, all these questions and making all these claims, but Mm -hmm. you don't get to trust. Or maybe you just turn Mm -hmm. and you start asking, and you don't get to request or trust. Like if you if you stop at any point in the process and don't get to trust, I think that's when lamenting goes wrong. I agree. Right, and so it's like if we okay, we turn to God and we start talking to Him, and Mm -hmm. we start and some of our talking is saying like God. I don't understand why you're doing this. This is not right. You're not good. You're this, you're that. And you start complaining from an unhelpful place right. mm-hmm. and that's all you do. Right. It's like, I, it's almost like the distinction between complaining and grumbling, which we know, you know, I think Paul's the one who says, don't you know, grumble. Never. Don't, like, do don't it. ever. It went badly for the Israelites. Yeah. Right? It's like, they, yeah, they less... grumble in the wilderness. Complaining with trust. And that I think is the key. Cause then grumbling is a lack of, trust yeah it's an grumbling is just like yes right and that to me feels like that difference between healthy complaint and unhealthy grumbling yeah because There's a we lack have to of trust. approach god yeah. humbly and then complain we have to have the right heart posture in our complaint of turning to god and that's why i talked about before in the message like we ha- we need to have these pro- three proper theologies about god you know theological truths before we even think about lamenting which is god hears us he sees us he knows us, like, you know, like, he cares, you know, he, he knows who I am, he sees me, he hears me, he cares about me. Yeah. Now, let's talk about limit, because mm-hmm. if we don't, if we don't know those three things, um, I, we mentioned last week, the book on Paul Tripp's uh, suffering book, he says, when we, and we talked, we even had the same conversation last week, if we have bad theology, we're going to suffer poorly, right? Mm-hmm. It, we just will, like, that's what's going to happen. If we believe any one of those truths twistedly, like if we say, "Oh, God sees me, but He doesn't hear me, right. He doesn't care about me," right? Oh, that'll lead us down the wrong path. Sure. When we turn to God, mm-hmm. we're like, "God, you haven't been here. You this, you that. Right. You're wrong." Mm-hmm. And it's like, nope, we went off the rails because that those are not true statements. Those are not true things. We could say if, we, but if we, those are almost statements David has made in the Psalms, though. But David has made these psalms of, God, it feels like you don't care. Sure. God, it feels like you don't see me. God, it feels like you have abandoned me. But I know you haven't. Right. So teach me what you want me to know in the midst of this. Right. Like we have to, in the midst of us not feeling it, we still have to believe the true statements yeah. about who God is and what he does. Right now I'm reading a book called um, Apathy. Um, and it's, it's all a book about when we are apathetic to the gospel and and to God and what do we do when we're not feeling it and the author made this statement in the book where he says I I think God brings us through these dry spells in our life where our quiet times or our times in worship we aren't feeling it because he needs us to know it's not about what we feel Mm -hmm. it's not about feeling it because well, God is true right. even in the midst when we right. don't feel it. One, and it frames our feelings, which is, yeah. you know, when I was younger, it was almost like feelings were always bad. Yeah. And you stuff them and then you just yeah. replace them with spiritual platitudes of like, God is always good and all the time God is good or whatever that statement is or whatever other, you know, verse you want to slap onto something. And you suppress these emotions. But yet what I love about lament and the Psalms, it... it, it when you have a right theology, as we've talked about, it frames our ability to bring those, don't stuff those emotions, but bring those emotions yeah. and trust them and lay them and come to God, trusting yeah. though and, and turning and knowing that, yes, you are good. Yeah. I know there's a plan here. And I think there's like two extremes of the spectrum. When you talk about emotion, there's kind of more of our conservative, baptistic roots of, of emotions where we, in our feelings, are like, uh, me and you were kind of very raised similar, and Brad, even all three of us, right? Of like, no, emotions not good. We need to be holy and reverent before the Lord, and even our bad emotions, we stuff them. We don't bring, we don't talk about that because God's good, and all these different things. But then there's, and we think that's a good testimony. We do but think it, that's a good but testimony. It's a horrible it's testimony. It's not good, and right. it's not, not the good. picture the scriptures paint. No, right? the scriptures are far more real. Yeah, about because uh, David, what we David, in the midst of one of the stories that's really crazy that I was reading recently was when David brings the Ark of the Lord 
you know, back into the Jerusalem and he's dancing in the streets. Mm-hmm. And then his wife is very upset about it. And he's wearing, it says, the scripture says he's wearing an ephod, which mm-hmm. is the, the, the robe of uh, the high priest, the undergarment of the high priest. And, okay. and I, I was, uh, you know, that, that whole theology of what David's teaching his people is he viewed, he viewed the kingship as helping people learn to worship God fully in his presence, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. not as this economic government system and everything like that. And so he was just being so open. Like he's not walking back in the temple like a king who's conquered conquest, mm-hmm. even though he had. He's walking, he's coming back in the, into the city celebrating and dancing. And he's like, yes, we can worship God fully because we have the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God back mm-hmm. in our city. Yes, He's doing these things. And then we have the opposite extreme of his negative emotions of he's bearing his heart before the Lord when it feels like God's abandoned him, but he hasn't. But then there's this other extreme of our of tradition in Christianity, which, um, you know, we have people at our church who were raised kind of like Pentecostal. And Lewis and I, you know, the worship leader of the Rochester campus talk about this a lot of, you know, emotions are everything. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you need to feel it. If you're not mm-hmm. feeling it, then like, what's wrong with you? Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of like, we're, talking about apathy or just like this, these feelings of like, I just don't feel anything right now. Mm -hmm. And that's okay too. Like, like our emotions should not drive our, yeah, who God is or what he is, what he, who he is, what he does or any of those things. Or be the proof proof of his goodness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I I was kind of curious with, with Nate here to knit together week one and week two. Yeah. So, Nate, can the joy you spoke of last week coexist with the lamentation Daniel mm. spoke about this mm-hmm. week? That's a word. I'm glad yeah. you asked that to <laughs> Nate. Well, I think we've already, we, <laughs> we've just been talking about that. Is like, that was kind of the, the theology, right? Yeah. Like, that's this framework and understanding of the long view. Like, the long view on this, we know these truths to be uh, of who God is, and we know that he is good, and he's true, and he's working out a plan. We know that one day he's going to win. We know the end of the story. I think that that's what helps, again, place the lament in the right mm, place yeah. and place the emotions in the right place that don't lead us to somehow mm. God is absent, he fell asleep, or, you know, is somehow not present or aware of what's happening. But because I know that, that, that joy then is known and experienced even in lament, yeah. I think is part of that journey. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. We had uh, an interesting discussion a couple of times. I was in groups this week discussing, you know, your sermon and that, and that joy. But um, actually, and you asked like about the people we've seen who suffer, who we admire because of, you know, what they've gone through. But just to see some of the things that we didn't know were possible, would it be true for me? So, for instance, you know, a woman in our group who four years ago lost her son to violence. Mm-hmm. You know, and she's, and I admire her. She's amazing. And within hours of her hearing that her, her, her son passed, she was in church. And I'm like, I would never go to church. I wouldn't have left my house, you know. But, uh, but her, for her to turn, you know, and, and we talked to her about joy because there was no joy. I mean, joy, joy wasn't... You know, I don't know what was it. It wasn't acting joyful. No, it wasn't yeah, dismissing yeah, yeah. emotions. Right. It's considering again. It's computing. Part of joy is like, mm-hmm. it, yeah, you may not feel the mm-hmm. joy like now, right. or, you yeah. know, but yet yeah. it's again this. This I'm going to compute. I'm going to see and know that right. there there is a joy. There is right. something God's going to use. But even this. to lament in those darkest of times, there is something. You know, right. there is a God who is the source or, or strength and. There is some concept of joy, you know, in the dark, darkest and worst of it. So um, I think I think what brought that up what yeah. just came to my mind. I was like pulling up the scripture in uh, Hebrews twelve, two. You know, it's talking about our faith and looking to Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of our faith. And there's that phrase in there that who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Yeah. And so he had joy set before him. But we read Hebrews five. Mm-hmm. I read Hebrews five seven through nine, which was talking about. He cried out in pain, anguish, all these different things. And we're, we're kind of marching towards Easter, right? We have uh, some different series that we'll get in bef- uh, leading up to Easter but um, here at Northridge. But in the midst of that, think about, like, we know what Christ did in Gethsemane. He was not like, yay, God, mm-hmm. I'm about to go die in the morning. Like, no, he was, he was 
crying out in anguish. Luke says that he had sweat drops that were like droplets of blood. And mm-hmm. and he was praying so fervently. He had that anxiety washed over him. Like, man, like, that does not seem like joy. Right. And so answering your question yeah. that you asked Native, like, yeah. I think we have a very poor definition of joy. not only how do we engage our pain through lamenting, but like, uh-huh. what does it mean to be actually joyful according to the scriptures? Right. And it's not this like lackluster avoidance happiness like we're not going to think about our pain we just be like woo it's all good because god's good and i'm good like fake it till we make it kind of joy this is mm. like a there's okay. a oh, there's a we have a rock in our in our life that is firmer that is fixed that is not going to be moved and we trust in that thing that says in the midst of all of this I can be joyful because I know I have a firm, fixed foundation that is Christ and the work that he has done on my right. behalf. And no matter how this turns out, mm-hmm. I know God's good. He's, he, and he wants to use it. And, and like, I know where I'm, I know I'm going to be in heaven. Like you have all these truths that say in spite right, of right. this, I right. know these to be true. And the path to that is through yeah. this godly yeah. lamentation. Yeah. And I want to, I want to, I want to not only believe these truths, but I want to navigate this life and this situation like Christ is calling me to. And Mm -hmm. this was a pathway that the scriptures lay out of this lamenting. So, well, listen, I got a couple of things I want to do before, you know, you know, uh, before we finish up here, one of them, you mentioned Hebrews and um, I know that we were talking about in pre-preach and whatnot. It's just like, is, is, did, did Hebrews really teach that Jesus changed and learned something? That, mm. It sounds like heresy to me. But uh, <laughs> it sounds, it's, it sounds it, like heresy to and me. We, and we brought Nate Miller in here as our theological yeah. expert. Yeah, you're the theological <laughs> right. expert. Come on, Nate. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you? Ha- what was the verse? I remember yeah, I the got verse. Right here. You you got so Hebrews it. five seven through uh, nine. I'm. I'm verse re- seven was the yeah, one. Yeah, right? I'll just read the one verse. Uh, it, it's verse eight, uh, and the first phrase of verse nine. I'm reading the ESV. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience. And that's probably the phrase that Brad's flag in first phrase, uh, through what he suffered. Yeah. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation. Those are the two phrases. So being made perfect, he became. So it's it it almost has this connotation of changing uh, that we see. And then he learned obedience. So if he's learning, then he obviously had some. Did he change? Right. You know, like right. Jesus uh, the same yesterday, today, yeah. and forever. God doesn't change. What's up? Mm-hmm. So, so what's what's that about? So Nate? let's talk about this, guys. This is uh, <laughs> this is what we refer to within the the scholarly world, Nate the is theology me now. of the hypostatic union. <laughs> mm. That's what we have at work here, folks. Right, right. This is uh, this is this is the God man, though. This is like you have got Jesus being is. fully God and fully man. So there's right. humanity that he grew in stature, like, and we see throughout his life that he learned and he grew. And even here, yep. we see a glimpse of his humanity, even though he 100 percent is fully God. Right. Um, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it is a mystery for sure. But that's exactly where the tension is because we do have a human, a man who grew. He clearly changed physically and 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 the rest of it, and yet he is still God. Which is that's going to be a mystery that's impossible yeah. to solve. Right. But we certainly get a glimpse of it right there in that text. I think. Yeah, I think too is like in in the sense of like does him learning in his nature there is this mysterious i, I don't want to deduce it mm-hmm. too low of like oh help, this will help you grasp it you know the truth we know is hebrews also says hebrews 13 8 christ is the same yesterday today and forever right so how do we rectify these two truths that he has these uh he is one you know union this hypostatic union of these two natures he has the flesh and he is divinity. And I think a really helpful analogy is like, well, what does it mean for Christ to become human and eternal and, and enter into eternal sonhood through his humanity? Because we know that Christ, when he ascended back into heaven, ascended in bodily form. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, theologically throughout history, you know, Orthodox theology says Christ is still today, you know, wrapped in flesh because we're going to see his nail scarred hands right. and his nail, his, his spear pierced side. And like, so he still, he, he chose to lower himself by taking on the nature of a human. And in that he was wrapped in flesh that his divinity while he's here on earth, he was wrapped in flesh 
and suppress some of the things that made him God. He did not leave aside mm-hmm. his godliness. Mm-hmm. He left aside his glory. Mm-hmm. And so what it meant for him to be worshiped as the second person of the Trinity, he mm-hmm. set that aside. He did not set aside what it meant for him to be God. Mm-hmm. And so in the midst of that, in his process, as Philippians 2 says in the Christ hymn of t- Philippians 2, 5 through 11, is he is humbling himself. Mm-hmm. And that in of itself is a process of not this one-time event. It mm-hmm. was a 33 years long journey of he humbled himself to be conceived in Mary, in her womb, and be mm-hmm. born mm-hmm. And, and live a life of humble just submission to the Father's will and 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 grow in stature among humans mm-hmm. in in his wisdom and his in his stature as Luke 2 52 says like in the sense of like he's growing in his wisdom and how other people look at him and he mm-hmm. he learned that obedience in the sense of like that process of like he's still submitting he's still submitting mm-hmm. he's still in the in the desert and we talked about that a couple weeks ago he's submitting to the Father's will not my will I'm not going about this in my way per se, but his way was the Father's way, you know, mm-hmm. so they're not separated. So there's this mystery, but it's like, yeah. man, we can't get over what Jesus did yeah. in his in his whole act of his life, not just that one-time event, but that, the whole life is his humility and obedience. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I probably went too long on a rabbit trail. Well, it it's it's impossible to adequately, I don't know if you ever can adequately answer it and certainly can't do it in a short amount of time. But the very last thing I wanted to get to, and it should have been the first thing, yeah. Yeah, was the elephant in the first. room, was the fact that we heard on Sunday, uh, Daniel, that that was your last message. That was. And this is my last podcast, guys. This is your last podcast. I wanted podcast. to get it all out there. You Unless know? he comes back as a guest speaker, maybe. Who knows? Hey, like, there maybe we go. we'll do that. You know? Yeah. So I, th- I feel like the out. podcast is a bit of a backstage pass to see how the sausage is made. So it's kind of funny because online campus, because our videographer, Ian, was in Israel, we had to shoot three weeks early. <laughs> so Taylor and I like recorded for the online studio completely oblivious, joyfully oblivious <laughs> to the fact that you were leaving. It looks like we could not have cared less oh. that you were leaving, but that is not oh, the yes. case. That's we are great. so, yeah. we are so grateful for your ministry. Yeah. So we are lamenting yes. your departure, yes. and uh, but we're I grateful. Set it up well, you know, uh-huh. yeah, we're grateful. But uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, we'll miss you, bro. Yeah, we're gonna miss Rochester. You know, uh, it's irony. We know that God has just has you know covered this whole process of us. Of uh, it's not something we sought out or anything. We just want to be obedient to what God wants us to do. You know, mm-hmm. and that the prayer I constantly come back to is you know bringing up Mary. Uh, and when the angel appears to her, I feel like the scripture that I've went back to over and over again is when it's not in Mary's plans, but it's in God's plan of what mm-hmm. he wants her to do. Her just humble submission is, may I am the Lord's servant, may your will be, be made known. You know, it's just like, may your will be accomplished, you know, kind of thing. And that's been our prayer through this whole process. And we yeah. love, love, love Northridge, the people, um, and just can't say more about it. So, yeah. so that's how you want us to pray. Yeah. Not that it'll go horribly wrong and we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no blessings oh, on so you. Good. I Thank know you so the much, Lord guys. will bless. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, listen, thanks for joining us this week for a little better. We look forward to seeing you again real soon. Yeah.